Good afternoon, one and all. I welcome you all to the, one of the biggest event of Research Scholars Day. On behalf of IIT Madras, I welcome Dr. Ulrich Spieshofer and his team to our beautiful campus. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ulrich to all of you. He is the pre president and chief executive officer of ABB Limited, a $35 billion company which is specialized in power and automation technology. ABB is known for its innovation and vision that enables utility and industry customers to improve performance and lowering their environmental effect. ABB has a 125 year history of pioneering technology and leadership. Having developed, having developed a HVDC transmission lines or uh, the solar impel, impel, impulse which has, the solar impulse which went around the world last year and the first industrial robot which is displayed in our campus. These all are the innovations of ABB. And prior to becoming CEO in 2013, Dr. Spieshofer led ABB's discrete, ABB, led ABB's discrete automation and, mo and motion division, where he doubled the revenues and improved the prof profitability and drove in integration of ABB's largest acquisition, Balder Motors, which was the largest motor company in North America. He was previously executive committee member for corporate development, responsible for strategy, merger and acquisition, supply chain management, and operational excellence. He also set up ABB's venture capital arm and developed ABB's successful cost-effective program. Dr. Spieshofer obtained his PhD from University of Stuttgart in, Stuttgart in Germany and holds a master's degree in business administration and engineering from the same university. We'll have a short video about uh, ABB. For 125 years, our technology has been driving the modern world. Pioneering technology to keep the power flowing and laying the tracks for the future. Shaping the fourth industrial revolution to bring people, data and technology together. Connecting people and technologies on land in the skies and the sea. Leading the way in power and automation for utilities, industry, transport and infrastructure. In fact, we've been pioneering technical breakthroughs for as long as we've been around. While others are planning for the future, we're creating it. 125 years of innovation. Join us for the journey ahead. How cool that. How many of you aspire to join ABB? Oh. <laughs> okay, I'm one among you. Okay, so. Uh, without much ado, uh, I invite Dr. Spieshofer to come on to DAS and uh, deliver his lecture. Please. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for having us today here. I'm really delighted to be together with you this afternoon and spend a bit of time sharing some experience, talking a little bit about ABB but talk about why we are all here together. Talk about technology and what technology can do for the world. What India as a country, what you as a young energetic Indian team of technologists can do to really join us on the journey to make this world better by using technology in a smarter way and te taking technology to the next level. Today I'm very, very honored and I would like to express my thanks, Director Mama. Uh, Ramamurti and Professor Junjanwala 
to have me here. Today is a real highlight in my year uh, 2016, because I would describe it as the day of the number ones. Uh, this morning, when I got up early after arriving at midnight last night at Delhi Airport, the first thing that I saw on TV was um, a notice and an announcement that IIT has been selected as the number one engineering school here in India. So congratulations to all of you. I think you should be very proud of that achievement and see it as an opportunity to take it in the future. The second number one event that I had today was this morning I had the opportunity to sit down and was hosted by your Prime Minister, Mr. Modi. And we had a very good discussion on where India stands and what technology will do for this country going forward and what his expectations are, uh, how we work together between government, education, and industry to take this con uh, country forward. So a number one university, the number one head of state, uh, have both welcomed the number one in power and transmission which is ABB, and I look forward to spend the next half an hour sharing with you why I'm so excited and what this is all about. We will also make sure that at the end we have a bit of time for questions and answers, because you don't believe it, it was only about 20, 25 years, or probably 25 years ago, that I sat on the other side here and was always intrigued by listening to industrial leaders uh, complimenting my own understanding and understanding of what the opportunities in the world are. So let me quickly introduce ABB to you. You might have heard about our logo. You might have seen it. You have seen us about an electrical engineering firm. And whatever you do in life, I think it is very important as a leader in technology, as a leader in business, that you articulate very clearly what is the identity of the topic, the company, the subject that you're working on. What direction do you take it? And how do you create momentum going forward? So the identity of ABB is quite simple. We do power and automation for utilities, industry, and transport and infrastructure. We do it all around the world with about 135,000 people. We have about 35 billion of turnover. We are active in more than 100 countries. Uh, this year, we are celebrating 125 years of serving the world from Switzerland with fantastic technology. So if you look at the structure of ABB, there are a couple of things which are quite unique. The one unique thing is our global footprint. We have about a third of our business in Europe, about a third in the Americas, and a little bit more than a third, in fact, it's the largest part of ABB today, in Asia, Middle East, and Africa. So for us, we are one of the best balanced global players, but it also means we have the obligation to provide technology that suits many, many different markets all around the world. Our heritage in India goes back about 100 years. In fact, we are manufacturing here in India already since 60 years in our 39 uh, manufacturing plants in 12 different sites. Uh, we have close to 10,000 people here Roughly a third of them are R&D and engineering people that really work with us in developing technology. So this is a high-tech company in a com country where we have a very strong and long-term legacy. And I'm very, very pleased to, to today inaugurate and start uh, the next level of collaboration between IIT and ABB going forward. When we talk about India, let's quickly talk about ABB's technology and what difference we have been allowed to make here in India together with our customers. Did you know that 50% of the solar installations in India are powered up with ABB equipment? Whether it's our inverters, whether it's our low voltage technology, we have the best offering between the grid and the point of consumption. We partner with panel providers to make sure we use the opportunities of renewable energy here in this country. Just recently, we opened the first stage of a project that is Northeast Accra, where we are transporting six gigawatt of power over more than 1,700 kilometers 
from the Himalayas, water power from Himalayas, to the center of India, to the Agra region. That's a, a first in lifetime achievement. And as a pioneering technology leader that we have always been and will always be, we are particularly proud of the achievements of our strong Indian team here in collaboration with our people all around the world. If you look at the cement plants, 50% of the cement plants that were opened up in the last five years have ABP control technology. So we are not only doing the transmission of electricity, we do also the automation piece of uh, industrial plants. Half of the locomotives, the diesel powered locomotives in India have an ABP turbocharger on it to drive fuel efficiency, the torque and the efficiency of the overall uh, locomotive. And quite frankly, we also have here for example, auxiliary converters and traction converter business here in India, where we are bringing up high efficiency, also electrical motive, uh, mo uh, locomotive operations. One of the largest CARA systems, a system that controls the distribution level of power transmission and distribution, has been installed here in India, in one of your states, where we are supplying 18, pe uh, 18 million people with a single control system, which is again, a hallmark of the technological complexity that we are able to mention. And I could go on and on and on. So you see, we are at home here. We have strong technology roots. Now, what's going on around us? And what's happening? It was so interesting to compare thinking this morning with Premi Modi on two topics. The one topic is what's happening on the electricity, on the power value chain, all around the world and here in India. You see an emergence of renewable power generation. Solar and wind are picking up quite quickly. Not too far out, the installed base of solar and wind will be more than a third of the globally installed power generation capacity. And what does that really do to the electric, uh, to the electrical value chain? And not only to the flows of the electrons, but also to the controls of the bits and bytes that we need to control that system. Renewables mean a couple of things. Less predictability, more volatility, more feeding points, and longer distance. Isn't that an engineer's dream as to optimize that and to make sure it still gives sta pay, stable power supply and get it going? So when you have longer distances, more feeding points, less predictability, more volatility, making the power flow stable across a power grid bringing it to the consumers is one of the key challenges that we face, but also one of the opportunities. And then on the local level, and that's specifically relevant here in India, where more than 300 million people are not yet connected to a permanent power grid, the question is how do we bring power to the people, to all people in India? And here it's quite clear that a coexistence of the conventional power grid with micro and nano grid solutions will be the solution for the future. The government has committed by 2025 to connect another 14,000 villages here in India of the 30,000 villages which are not yet having permanent power supply to get them powered up with microgrids. It was so fantastic to open up the day here, coming over, driving with an electric car that should be charged by ADB, by the way, um, drive over to the little installation that you have there where you show a DC powered solar house it's just fantastic to see how much the IIT interests and ABB interests really match together. Because one thing is very clear. Microgrids, renewable powered electricity supply is changing the world. It's not will, it is changing the world today. And we are right in the center of this exciting technology journey and we are driving it in a very active way. But it does not only mean the flow of the electrons is more complicated. How do you really control a situation where you have microgrids, the conventional grid, and sometimes both of them connected in a way that when you do a paint job on a, auto or on a car, which is produced in India, that you have power, stable power supply going into your paint job where you paint cars with robots. Because I can show you on the front hood of an Audi whether the power supply during the paint process has been stable or not. So what we need to do is we need to bring in voltage conditioning, we need to bring in uninterrupted power supply, we bring in power quality solutions to make sure 
that the highly volatile, less predictable renewable space doesn't end up in uh, Audi front hood that looks like a boiled uh, kind of, of piece of potato that looks like a smooth surface. So these are the opportunities around the grid. And I already mentioned our ultra high voltage direct uh, current power transmission capability. In 1954, ABB invented high voltage direct current power transmission, which is a way to transport large amounts of power over long distances with good reliability and low losses. ABB is a leader. We continuously develop that technology, and we are very proud to have the most exciting and most challenging technology installation of, of that technology here in India in the Northeast Agra project that I just, just mentioned before. Now, just look at this little image. This is our technology, and it looks like a Lego stone. Huh? And this is a human being. Just to get you a feeling how big this is, this is 38 meters high transformers in large halls that really provide that technology here in India reliably uh, that we have provided. Now, on the other end of the power value chain, there's microgrids. We had in Delhi in fall, we had an exhibition where we launched our microgrid offering, where we bring together solar, wind, storage, battery storage, and uh, backup power generation on the diesel side in one common system to make sure we can power up remote villages. And we have already installed the first uh, microgrids here in India. So on the power side, we have a dramatic shift driven by the renewables. What's happening on industry? What's happening in automation? What's happening in the world of industrial control? As you all have heard, probably the world is full, the newspapers are full, we are going into fourth industrial revolution. Now, the first industrial revolution was about the steam engine. The second one was about the assembly line. The third was about the PLCs. And the fourth one is about internet-based revolution. And it's not only the internet of things. ABB believes this is a far too narrow perspective. It's not about connecting the things only. It's connecting the things, the people, and the services. Only by doing that will we bring up true productivity improvement and through the next level of uptime speed and yield of industrial processes. Why is this possible? And what's so special about it? If you look at it, very soon there will be more connected things than people on this earth. And this will grow exponentially going forward. Computing bandwidth is ubiquitous and computing power is cheap. Data storage is possible in a way like never conceivable before. So all together, we have a couple of enablers now out there which help us really to take productivity to a completely different level and think about solutions that were not thinkable just some years ago. Now let me give you some concrete examples and get your mouth a little bit watery, give you a taste on the technologies that we are already working on and what technology, what technology could do in the future. First, let me introduce a couple of facts about ABB. We are a $35 billion company. More than half of our offering today is already software-based. More than half of our offering is software-based, which means we are active in the, all three buckets of, of software, embedded software in the devices, control software to control processes, and application software to either support planning or operations of industrial utility or infrastructure assets all around the world. Our smallest application is a small switch. Nowadays, every light switch which is connected to a building control system has a couple of lines of software in it. And our largest system, which is a network management system for a big, complex power grid network, for example, of the state of New York, has more than 5 million lines of software. And that's comparable with the software complexity of a commercial airliner of its entire control system that you have out there today. So we are right in this center. We are right in this space since many, many years. 
and we take the opportunities forward to provide more value to our customers. One example, and I'm really happy that we have the demo outside and invite you all to look at it later, uh, we have revolutionized robotics. Robo robots used to be in a cage because they were dangerous, orange painted because it's a hazard, and really something very, very difficult to program. Yumi, our new robot, is changing all three paradigms. Number one, it's out of the cage because it senses when you get too close and it stops the operation. Number two, it's a friend because you can program it very simply by guiding the two arms and take a software, self-learning software that optimizes itself in terms of the movement and accuracy to really get going. So it's a collaborative robot that is revolutionary. And if you look at the accuracy of the two arms, anybody here in this room who does a little bit of mechanical engineering also? Anybody does a little bit of mechanical? Okay. So how difficult is it to take two seven axle arms and make them so accurate that you can put the, the, the thread through the needle? Very difficult, huh? We did it. And that's something that is quite unique. <laughs> this, this product is so revolutionary. We showed it last year at the Hannover Fair. And you see here, we had uh, German Chancellor Merkel, we had Prime Minister Modi coming to our stand. And we took quite a bit of time uh, to learn about it. And I can tell you that was one of the scariest moments of my life. Because the German Chancellor, she asked and said, is this really safe? I said, yeah, yeah. It stops when you touch it. And she said, OK, let's try it. And you know, you know what she did? She took two fingers, and the robot has a gripper that does that. I told her when she touches it, it stops. She said, no, no. She put the finger in the gripper. <laughs> and thank God the headline was not, ABB cuts the chancellor's fingers. <laughs> uh, the headline was, ABB produces a collaborative safe robot. So thank God the technology went well. And this is, a, this is a hallmark of the way we do technology. This robot was done by a combined team of Chinese, German, and Swedish colleagues. This robot was done in a collaborative approach between some startup, younger technologists, together with some very experienced people. And it's now being used and app applied in all the countries of the world. And you see it outside. It recently, in the February Made in India Fair, we had it again here in India. We showed it together with Prime Minister Modi. It's a fantastic opportunity to demonstrate true technology leadership. Now, these robots are one example of what you can do in the modern world of the Internet of Things, services, and people. Let's just theoretically close your eyes quickly Imagine you have two of these robots standing somewhere in a robot factory, let's say, in France. On the one arm of the robot, the bearing in the third joint starts to rattle and vibrate a little bit. In the joint, there is a vibration sensor. That vibration sensor goes via the IP address of the robot with a signal to our remote service center here in Bangalore in India, where we control today thousands of robots uh, remotely. It brings in the signal, and that signal is being read and compared against the repository of all operating signal that we have ever collected on robots. And with some predictive uh, uh, analytics, we look at the signal and say, OK, based on the learning that we ha have had before within 70 hours, this robot will break down if you don't do something. Then the software dispatcher and, and the remote service uh, dispatcher automatically goes another software package and looks which service technician is close to this robot in France. We see he's very close, but there's a lot of traffic around. So our automatic traffic guidance system is being used to take this robot service technician fastest to the place of the service job. And while he is going there, he gets the disassembly instruction for that specific kind of failure or potential failure 
displayed on his iPad. He takes his iPad, walks into a factory that he has never been in before, puts it on video streaming, swipes it around, and the safety instructor in the remote service center recognizes two safety hazards which the person itself might have overlooked. That's the Internet of Things, the robot, the services, the maintenance, and the person. That's what we can do today to really drive industrial productivity using the Internet, using the things, using data to really get forward and drive productivity in industry to the next level. Now, the Bangalore Center, and you will see it outside, we have in the little demo booth, you can see that, is not only connecting robots. It's connecting motors. It's connecting PV plants. So all around the world, is operating data of industrial assets, whether they're in the plan or in the operate phase, come together and we use them in a smart way using on the one hand the data storage, the remote service capabilities, but then really the smart, smart technological uh, innovation power that we have here in India and our team to really read this data and program the right algorithms and to make sure we understand what needs to happen to drive uptime speed and yield in industrial processes. So that's an example out of the discrete industry. Let's go to another example. We have a collaboration with BMW and many other car OEMs where six years ago we started a venture. We said the world of mobility is going electric. And ABB wants to be a partner of the OEMs. So we did a startup on electric mobility charging infrastructure. We put our own people there and we realized very quickly that certain capabilities in terms of the B2C, the consumer interface, the fleet operations, the billing, we didn't have the right kind of competences in ABB. So we bought another startup company in the Netherlands with about 80 people and we put them together with the ABB team. We ripped the ABB team out of the ABB offices and put that in the, in the bus garage in the Netherlands where we really had the startup team going. So we did not take the startup team out of the startup. We put the ABB people into the startup environment and got them going. Then we realized very quickly after a couple of years of pilots and getting this business up to speed, there's a vast amount of data. And there's a huge amount of requirements on, on cloud-based data storage. And we sat down with Microsoft. I had a couple of meetings with Satya Nadella, my friend and colleague who is running Microsoft. And we said, Satya, you have domain agnostic data storage and data computing capability. We have the EV charging, the power electronics piece. Let's work together. And we set up a partnership. And that's one hallmark of the modern ABB to work on innovation together with partnerships and not only individually as a company. Because I believe very strongly in a connected world, intelligence and capabilities also need to be connected far beyond the individual companies. Another example is shipping. What can the Internet of Things services and people do in shipping? Quite simple. We have an agreement, or we work together with Maersk, which is one of the sh biggest shipping lines in the world. And we have a specific software capability where we help Maersk with the following. We look at the specific ship. We look at the loading pattern and the load that goes into the ship. We look at the weather forecast. And we look satellite-based at the actual wave conditions on the route that the ship is scheduled to, to take. And then we optimize the route for safety, for speed, and for energy efficiency to really make sure that we live in the right time, a very safe with the lowest uh, uh, um, energy consumption, the ship arrives at the point of destination. So if you take our company, 125 years of innovation. Whether it's steam turbines, whether it's the first high voltage direct current line, whether it's the first industrial robot in 1974 where ABB invented the industrial robot. And when you look at the recent innovations, I already talked about some of them, we have a very strong heritage of innovation. And it's very clear that the innovation pattern is changing. We do four things. We do what I call functional hardware. 
which is the copper and iron stuff, the motors, the transformers. We do about 8 billion of electronics. We do software and we do services. And there is a pattern change in the future because there are two things changing and I want you all as young technologists to think about it. There are two things changing in industry. The participation rights and the differentiation opportunity. 10 years, 15 years ago, it was good enough to have the most energy efficient motor for your customer. That's not the participation right in the future anymore. In the future, this motor needs to speak. It needs to communicate. It needs to self-diagnose. And only then will you be able to participate as a first tier supplier in industry. So we need to the hardware and electronics capability, much more software and service capability in the future. And the second piece that's fundamentally changing is the way you differentiate in industry. In the past, it was the efficiency of a single asset. In the future, it's uptime speed and yield of a set of assets along a value chain that you bring together in an overall optimization based on the Internet of Things, services, and people. So we will go there, we will stay ahead by expanding the way we do technology development, research and development ourselves as ABB. Historically, we were strong on in-house research and development. We are partnering with universities and I'm very, very proud that today is a key milestone in our partnership with IIT. And I'm very, very, very grateful. <laughs> and I'm very, very grateful that we can work together and I look forward to kick off this relationship and there's much more to come alone on that car ride today. I already had a lot of ideas spinning in my head so you fasten the seat belts. We probably come in with full, full steam. We will also work stronger in the future on R&D on partnerships. I give you a concrete example. Recently, I gave my motor team a task and said, I want a speaking motor, a speaking self-diagnosing motor. How much does this cost if we do it the ABB way? Well, they said we need sensors, we need processing, we need battery supply, we need communications. It costs a couple of hundred dollars to really establish that. Then we partnered with a company that has an offering that does something quite simple. It does smart analytics on a toothbrush. The electric toothbrushes out there today that measure with which power, with, which with force you brush your teeth for how long. And it articulates that, puts that in a processor, and that processor has battery supply and it communicates with your iPhone. And when I sat down with that company, I said, how much does that cost? He said, one buck seventy. I said, I need that on my motor. <laughs> so what we did is we set up two teams. We set a team automotive and we set a team consumer electronics. The consumer electronics team worked with the toothbrush provider and the automotive team worked with automotive companies because there's a lot of sensing technology as well. And guess what? We brought the cost to sense, to program, and to communicate down by 92%, 92%. And I'm very, very happy to share with you that our Indian team here in the Research and Development Center in India played a crucial role in challenging the old paradigm and say we can do this better. And coming down by 98%, remaining only with 8% of the cost, means we can now afford to put that everywhere. And out of the sudden, the vision of having speaking self-diagnosing and communicating products is becoming real. And if any one of you comes to the Hanover Fair or go on our website, what we will come out with around the Hanover Fair, this is a fantastic opportunity that we are realizing. I've already talked about the startup mentality and one thing is very clear. A lot of people think startups work only separately. That's true if you don't do it right. But ABB, we have a startup mentality. We did e-mobility, we did small small parts assembly robot, you're doing many more. And if you do it right, we might provide an easier start because when you take our platform, you don't need to worry about how you pay your people, how you pay your taxes, how you do the financial uh, accounting. All of that can be provided. And it's an easier up because we have the supply chain, we have the logistics that allow you to grow your business. 
So we will continue to spend significantly on R&D to invest about one and a half billion dollars a year to stay at the forefront of technology development. We will increase our global footprint of research and development. Today, about a third of our 10,000 Indian colleagues are in research and development and engineering. That will be more. So India will continue to play a key role going forward. We will complement our own activities ongoing with partnerships. I already mentioned some before, whether it's global companies, whether it's local companies, we are partnering for better cu customer value. So for example, on the microgrid, ABB will not do the battery technology itself. We are partnering with BYD and Samsung. On solar, we will not do the panel ourselves. We are partnering with some players. So that's the basic logic. So our technology pattern will be one where we plug in with different ecosystems and make sure we have complementary skills to drive innovation. But one thing is also very clear. We will need to keep investing in the unthinkable, into pioneering startups, into fields that we don't even dare to dream about what comes out in the future. We have a technology venture fund that I set up in my previous, previous role in ABB, which is aimed at tapping technologies of the day after tomorrow to really make sure we stay on the forefront. And we are investing there in different areas. One investment that we have done together with Elon Musk and a couple of others is a company called Vicarious in artificial intelligence. And these guys dream about self-learning processes, self-learning machines. And I sit down with them uh, every now and then. And recently, I sat down with them a couple of weeks ago one more time. And it's absolutely mind-boggling what's coming and at what speed. When you see now a computer beating the world champion in Go, then you know what will be possible in the industrial environment, and we will stay at the forefront. Another example is the combination of 3D printing and robotics. In a couple of weeks' time, we will be printing and robot assembling a bridge. So in the Netherlands, there is a river, and on the side of the river will be two things. There will be a robot, or a set of robots, and a 3D printer. And they together will build a bridge over this river. We have already done it in a pilot. <laughs> we have already done it in a pilot, and we'll do more of that in the future. So when we look at where we are as ABB and where we are going, I hope I got you a little bit of my excitement about the technology base shared today, that you understand how wonderful it is to work in the field of power and automation. How attractive it can be to work in the environment of the big shifts on the electric value chain and on industry, and to tap the opportunities that we have. Because a couple of things are very clear. The fourth industrial revolution is for real, and it's not stopping at the factory. It's going everywhere, even in offices. ABB will stay at the forefront as a technology leader. And with the right team globally and here in India, together with our local team, with partners like IIT, we will be able to tap the opportunities to create more value for our customers going forward. And I would be very much looking forward to invite all of you to be part of our journey. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for the insightful talk. Now the floor is open for questions. Please raise your hand if you want to ask questions. Please pass on the mic. So please come with your questions. Please. Sir, uh, my name is Gopal. Uh, I'm working on uh, microgrids as well. So I just what? I'm working on microgrids. Yes. I just want to know. Uh, you said there are several villages in India that are not connected to the grid, and you say microgrid will be a solution. So how do you plan to uh, connect? Uh, how how is exactly is microgrid solution for connecting villages that are not powered? Now look, when, when, we, when we did the new strategy for ABB, we looked at fast growth segment for our company that built on our existing strength. There is a billion people in the world, one billion, which are not connected to permanent electricity supply. And a significant part of that population is based here in India. 
Now you have a choice how to, how to bring these people the benefit of electricity and let them participate in prosperity and wealth that, that this brings. You can either expand the existing grid or with the, with the upcoming of affordable renewable power generation, with the cost of battery storage coming down, and the efficiency of electrical appliances also going up significantly to have affordable off-grid solutions. So an affordable off-grid solution that we offer is a combination of a solar cell and a power supply to the point of consumption. And in the simplest term, and we saw that today, uh, it's a DC to DC power, power supply. You have a DC cell, you bring the DC cell to a DC charge point for your mobile phone, to a DC TV set, and off you go. But when you grow up a little stronger and you have multiple houses connected, you need to think about how you bring that together. So you need to have a stronger control capability. And with our PLC-based control, we have that. You need to think about what do you do at night uh, when the sun is not shining. So you need to think about whether it's battery storage or whether it's a diesel backup, how you bring it together. And if you do that, you need to have the right control alg algorithms in there. So all together, that the, that the supply pattern can be renewables combined with storage or renewables combined with storage and backup or only renewables combined with diesel. And on the, on the consumption side, it really depends on the quality of power that you want. It's quite simple to power up a fridge and it's not that simple to power up a computer in terms of the voltage quality or the, or the power quality that we want to have, and that depends. And so basically, you need a supply pattern, which is renewables plus conventional plus storage. You need a control element that controls the whole uh, power uh, supply and demand pattern, and then you need to make sure you make the power accessible at the point of consumption. Now, the microgrid phenomenon has been historically, a lot of people smile that, and very often we had solution where it was uh, remote conditions. We have a microgrid on Kodiak Island in Alaska where historically uh, it was renewable, it was solar and wind, and it worked quite well for this small village until they bought a new harbor grain. And when they bought a new harbor grain, the whole microgrid went down and every time the city or the village blacked out, when the harbor, grid, when the harbor grain moved its arm. So what did we do? we found an alternative way of energy storage that allows you to take off vast amounts of power very quickly. That's a flywheel. So we basically combined solar and wind plus a flywheel that was specifically used for the movement of the harbor grain and out of the sudden the grid was stable again. So the, the world of microgrids is huge, whether it's on grid, off grid, depends on the situation, at what scale and what, what amount of control you put in but it's probably one of the fastest growing electrical phenomena in the world that we see at the moment, and ABB is leading in that area. And if you're already working on that, let's get together with our microgrid team. We need a lot of good people that help us to ramp that one up. Good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. My name is Jalo Gurai. Actually, I want to know that, do you think that the automation is the one of the reasons for unemployment, like uh, India and other developing countries? <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much for your question. I get that every time when I'm on stage somewhere. <laughs> I give you a couple of anecdotes, and you form your own opinion. I at the end of the 19th century, people threw stones at the first cars because they were concerned that the horse carriage driver would get unemployed. In 1970s, when we came out with the welding robots for automotive, the unions at the beginning were very concerned because they said, this is a job destruction machine called a robot that replaces welding. And when you look at overall economies of the world, you see a discrepancy in unemployment in economies. Now let me run you through these three examples. Fact is that the move from horse carriages 
to automobiles created a lot of prosperity, a lot of wealth, and a lot of jobs, and employment went up with technological innovation. The invention of the welding robot in automotive helped people to avoid to, do weld, to have to do welding jobs, which is poisonous, which is, from a health perspective, really not a very nice, nice job to do. And the automotive industry today employs many more people than ever before. And the three countries, or three of the countries with the low, among the lowest unemployment rate in the world, Germany, Japan, and South Korea, have the highest robot density on Earth. So it's not about, is it a machine or me? It's about how, bring you to, to, how do you bring together technological progress with wealth and prosperity for mankind. If you do this right, automation will be a blessing to mankind. And like any technology, if abused, if used in the wrong way, it can be a hazard. If used in the right way, it can significantly add to prosperity. If you look at Yumi outside, I have a customer. He has 5,500 ladies that do end-of-line visual inspection of mobile phones. So they look at the mobile phone that comes down the line, look whether it's scratched or not. And if it's scratched, they put it here. If it's not scratched, they put it here. 5,500 ladies. Totally boring job, which is highly repetitive. In an area of, of an emerging market where there is high labor scarcity at the moment, and exploding labor costs. So to make sure you keep the people employed, to make sure that you drive productivity, that you are competitive, you invest in technology development and you get it forward. So my answer is very clearly, technology deployed in a responsible way can build also in the future, continue to create prosperity. We had this, this morning the discussion with Prime Minister Modi. If you look at how many people here in India are working in hazardous jobs, lifting heavy, painting stuff with poisonous paint. If you take technology and robotics right, you elevate the nature of work. And if you elevate the nature of work, you create productivity, you create prosperity, and you create more jobs than you destroy. But what, one thing, just one last one, is any technological change will make jobs disappear. And new jobs come in. So there is, you need to differentiate between jobs and work. The nature of jobs will change. And there are no horse courage drivers anymore. There are no car welders anymore. But there are people that build these cars, and there are people that really operate the robot and program the robot in the future. And that's a, a key point for you as young people. The world is changing faster than ever before. Be ready to an evolutionary work pattern over your life. Your work, the only thing that I can guarantee you, in 25 years, the work that you look at today will not be the same anymore as it is today. So you need to be get, get ready to participate in that journey of a changing work world and be ready to also change jobs to make sure that you continue to be deployed. So your institution has an absolutely fantastic opportunity to help young people to get going. But I think it's as important in the future to have lifelong learning and lifelong training, because also for 40, 50, 60 year old, the nature of work will be changing. So it's our responsibility between education, industry, and politicians to make sure that in the, in the fourth industrial revolution, and maybe there's a fifth summit coming, we take people with us. We take them forward, we make sure they prosper, and we support them with the right education and training. And then I'm very, very optimistic that also in the future, there will be a lot of work for people in a changing pattern. Thank you very much for uh, your presentation. Uh, one of the most interesting things that I found is that you are starting to s monitor every motor and every solar panel and every remotely um, with hundreds of millions of such monitoring. We ourselves are trying to monitor for each of those homes that we are deploying yes. our system. We are actually monitoring it remotely. But <coughs> soon you will have huge amount of data coming in. You will need <coughs> to 
good analytical analytics capability to be able to understand what is going on with that, where do you need to really spend uh, time in focusing rather than looking at all the data. I didn't hear you talk about analytics. What is your company's uh, interest in analytics and yeah. what is it doing about it? Yeah, look, first of all, you're absolutely right. If you take the, 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 the information noise that you create by making every asset speak, it's humongous. It's huge. So let me talk about a couple of elements of the future of data analytics and what, what I personally and what we believe in. First, the analytics will go closer and closer to the asset. It is absolutely important that, let's stick with the example of a motor, a, a motor becomes more and more intelligent and sends you less and less information. I think it's hugely irresponsible to set up a system where every data that's created by a sensor gets unprocessed into a space of storage. Nobody in the world could deal with that storage requirements and nobody could pay for it. So what we need to do is, we need to bring the analytics and the, and the intelligence into the asset itself as a first filtering step. That the motor already knows, now I'm, say, I'm seeing a normal sensing signal or now is coming something which is out of the pattern. And only the signals that are out of the pattern are going then in an overall system. That's the first point. The second point is you need to learn from big data. And we have invested significantly, and we will invest even more in analyzing big data. The inventor and the market leader globally in distributed control systems in process industry today is ABB. We just inaugurated a process plant in Saudi Arabia where we have 122,000 IOs on one large process plant, 122,000. Can you imagine what amount of data we already deal with today? So your point on data analytics is very, very important. So I think what we need to do is we need to be able to have the analytics and the parameterization or, or the, 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 the selection of data as close as possible to the asset. The information that comes up we need to find a way to see better pattern in data. And it's amazing when you take one, two, three, four steps away from your data and you start to develop some patterns in your data, what you really see. In a large oil and gas refinery, you might not only see an operating data element of a small control valve out there or a small part of the process where you take some feedstock and transform it, you might look at the overall pattern of the plant, compare it to some others, and say, look, if I correlate this operating pattern with somebody else, energy efficiency is a different level than somewhere else. And that's what we're working on. So we have significantly invested on smart analytics. The data storage piece, we outsource. That's with Microsoft, that's with partners, storing a piece of data on the servers. That's not ABB's core business, so we partner with somebody. The processing computer, is something that we don't build. But the software that this computer uses and the algorithms and the parameters that we, that we use, uh, we are really leading and we will invest. But do, what do you really need to do that? You need to have the capacity to get this data up and store them. You need the capacity to analyze patterns. And then you need to have the domain expertise, and that's something that a lot of people nowadays forget. You need, you need the domain expertise on a specific industrial process to say what this pattern really means and how you optimize. So when you go out there and you want to make a real difference, I think it's important that you realize there's always a place where technology gets deployed. And that's where the value comes. And therefore, having the, the information processing capability, having the computer power is really nice and interesting. But the value, and therefore also the money, will be always made at the point when you transform this data and information into decisions that create value in a commercial process. And that's typically in a domain and a specific application. So our investment pattern is quite simple. Uh, we invest in the analytic, we invest in the sensible machines, in the sensitive machines to get the information out. We partner, we invest in partnerships, but we don't do that ourselves, in data storage, 
and large-scale data processing. We invest ourselves directly in software capability and software engineering, and especially also in domain expertise to make the difference for a specific process. The ship data that I showed you before, we, we, we would be useless if we wouldn't understand how a container ship operates and what drives the fuel efficiency and the higher the waves get, the more fuel you need to get on time at a certain place. If you understand that and you use your data, then in the best possible way, and you understand that the trade-off between rerouting a ship and going through a high wave area, then you make a difference. There's another question there. Yeah. We'll have Hello. one last um, question. I'm uh, Bala. So I work on uh, system integration aspects of uh, IoT enabled smart manufacturing, right? So one of the, um, so I've been going to various industries which are working and taking their manufacturing uh, into the IoT space. And one of the biggest barriers I've seen is uh, a factory is typically composed of machines from different, uh, you know, manufacturers. And uh, there is, seems to be a huge debate on manufacturers as to which, uh, you know, which would be a good protocol to, uh, you know, communicate their machines with. But do you think um, through Industry 4.0 can be realized until there's a common consensus on uh, different uh, machine, you know, manufacturers has to have a standard system for, you know, IoT communication, standard system for data transmission. Like, for example, if someone is doing um, compressed sensing for, you know, reducing their amount of data bits, then, like, uh, uh, they, ten they generate tend to have a different communication protocol, right? Um, so what is your views on having such a standard protocol for an ent entire industry? Because it wouldn't really be possible for, like, uh, for me to um, optimize the performance of, you know, all the elements of factory without networking multiple machines. That is um, number one. Number two is um, many of these machines, they give us only a restricted amount of data, right? For example, when I'm researching, I get only, um, I, I know that there's gonna be, you know, a uh, thousand variables that the machine is going to, you know, take into uh, consideration for optimizing its factors. But what I get for, you know, my research is probably 10 of those variables. So wouldn't it be better to develop, you know, something like SDKs for those machines so that person, uh, people who want to access the internal data of the machine would also be able to access these data. And this will also given more space for, you know, people to come and develop something like, um, you know, applications, um, something like what we have Android applications, applications for this manufacturing industry. Um, I think that would open up a new space itself. So what are your views on this? Okay. Thank you very much for your short and concise question. I will try to get, <laughs> I will try to get on that right away. I think, I think you're touching a very, very important point. In the past, you differentiated through the output quality of a product that you were producing. And in the future, you will differentiate through using data smartly in the transformation process of a physical asset to get it produced. So the data out of the sudden becomes something quite different and something quite relevant. Now, when you, when you travel around the world as a CEO of an industrial firm like ABB, you see interesting patterns. You see startups in the Silicon Valley that couldn't care less who seeds their data, who have come up in a sharing community and have a completely different mindset. I can tell you, I have, I have two teenagers at home, my 14 and my 16 year old, when they go on a party somewhere, the first thing that they do, they put the party pictures on Facebook and show them around. I would have never done that in my generation. Nowadays, it's something new. So, so we need to be aware that we, we have a generation coming in that don't understand why we wouldn't share and why we wouldn't work together and why we wouldn't open up. So that's one element that, that we need to manage. The next element that we need to manage, I was recently in, in Europe at an enterprise roundtable of CEOs. And I was the CEO of a large German competitor of ABB. And he said, he really said, we need to protect Europe. And I looked at him and said, so what mobile phone brand do you use? He pulled out his iPhone. And I said to him, so what about protection of Europe here? So I think, I think the biggest trap that we can fall in there today is to build in a connected world four bridges which hinder progress. 
And I told him in that meeting that I'm gravely concerned that if any European cluster of countries or companies would say, we pull up the fall bridge, we don't have a data protocol that speaks with others, we become an island, well, the times of islands are over in industry. We need a connected world. So ABB has taken a decision that anything will be do, that, that we do will be open, will be connectable. And if you look at the many, many data communications protocol that we have flying around today, we need to build bridges to make sure we can fit them together under a couple of conditions. Number one, business is a competitive world out there. When you work for a company and the art of the company, the innovation power is a certain quality of an industrial process. And that certain industrial process is mirrored in a certain quality of data. You need to make sure that you don't harm this company and don't kill the jobs that this company has created by opening up the data to anybody that wants to have them in an uncontrolled way. So I think there is a difference between communication and connectivity and data exchange. The technical ability of connectivity and communication should be there everywhere. From my perspective, we need to have a co globally connected world where the connectivity is there. And then people need to, need to be able to decide themselves what do they want to make accessible or not. If you are invited to help a company with the next level of manufacturing, and the company doesn't open up to you, you will not give them the productivity increase that you want. But if they understand that, they say, say, take anything that I have, take all I have within my boundaries, and I give it to you to get the true productivity going. So the coexistence of connectivity and communication on the one hand, and focused data dissemination and communication is the art, and the companies that will be world champions in the future will master that successfully. Thank you, sir. Thank you for the elaborated answers. I request uh, Professor Junjunwala to felicitate our guest with a fruit basket. So please come on. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much for a great lecture. Huh? Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. I request uh, Professor Bhaskar Ramurthy to, to felicitate our chief guest with a memento. Please come, sir. Sir, one more. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's beautiful. That's a real leap that's been Very nice. Thank you very much. <laughs>